Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This program is different in that it is focused on the Bible. Uh, there is no uh, question about it. We believe with all our heart that the Bible is the most important, most Im most uh, necessary book in the lives of any human being, in your life and in your life. As a matter of fact, you know, the Bible has truth in it that no scientist, no historian has ever, ever, ever been able to know. It has secrets that are now being revealed because we're living right at the end. You know, that's what's so very significant and also very fascinating at this time. We're living right near the end of the history of this world, and God has decreed in His Word that at the time of the end, God would, as we near the end, that God would open our hearts and minds to a lot more truth that's always been in the Bible, but it is written in such a way that unless God uh, shows us from the Bible itself how to uh, find it, how to understand it, it remained a mystery. But in our day, there's all kinds of information that has never, never been discussed before in any seminary or any school of theologians or whatever. And yet it's all in the Bible. And as we talk together about it and, and, uh, and show where it is found in the Bible, you yourself can take your Bible, your Bible, wherever you are, and you can uh, find those, uh, read those same truths. You never, never want to trust a teacher. By all means, don't trust me or trust Family Radio. But we will direct you into the Bible and show you uh, what we have found, and then you can check it out for yourself, that indeed this uh, this is what the Bible is teaching. And it is a book that is super important because it uh, it, it, we have we as human beings have to do with God. We are accountable to God, and so there are some things we better know about. While well, it is still the time when such a wonderful thing as the possibility of becoming a child of God and receiving eternal life and having our sins all paid for is still is still happening, and in fact is happening with increasing rapidity because God has declared that right in this day, right in this time in which we are living, that there's a great multitude which no man can number that are being saved. Well, this is your program. We want to hear from you. So shall we take our first call tonight, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, you know, Mr. Campton, I've, I've been listening to family radio probably since 1989. And, you know, I always prided myself in inviting new believers to listen to your radio station. But, you know, ever since you've been telling people, don't go to church, I cannot refer new believers to you. And, you know, people like Jerry Edinger and others have left uh, family radio due to this stance, this dogmatic stance you have on something that really, I think, has no... Uh, fundamental value whatsoever in the Bible, telling people don't go to church. My friend, I think you're making a grave mistake. Oh, yes. Just like that book you wrote about 1984, about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think you might be in hot water, Mr. Campton, and that's all I want to say. Well, Bye -bye. you know that uh, I, I appreciate your call, and you're speaking for a great many people. The whole problem, however, is... Where are you getting your information? The fact is, if you listen at all to what is being taught on Family Radio, you'll find that it always comes from the Bible. It does not come because someone has had a vision, someone has had a, a dream, or someone has logically put some ideas together. It all comes as a result of very careful reading of the Bible. And, and uh, this is constant. The very fact that 
a program like Open Farm goes on, where I'm in a marketplace uh, five nights a week, uh, ready to take on any and every caller, means I better, better have an authority. And if, if it depended upon my brains, if it depend, depended upon my human wisdom, forget it. I wouldn't get to first base. Uh, the only reason I can face any and every caller is because it, it's not my idea, it's not my word, I'm simply teaching what the Bible says. Now, here's the problem. If you're a true believer, if a a true believer, and those in the churches uh, who are confessing members in churches really believe they are there because they are true believers. They really are born again. They are children of God. And yet, the Bible teaches very clearly that the characteristic of a true believer is that we want, we delight in the Word of God. We want to know anything and everything that the Bible teaches. But the big question is, why is it that those in the churches, uh, 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 even as our last caller gave, uh, seemed to indicate, uh, are in denial? You're not willing to check out what what we are declaring the Bible teaches, just to check it out. Is is this true or is it not true? To Just to take a position, you're wrong, you've been wrong about this, you've been wrong about that, and so on and so on. That doesn't say anything at all. The question is, uh, have you checked out what is being taught, or are you in denial? And I'm afraid, I'm afraid, that is the big problem. The world itself is in denial. They don't want to know, really know about Judgment Day and, and, and the fact that we're near the end of the world. And so they don't want to get into that question at all. And in the churches, they are, the people are in denial. They, uh, you, there are people who, uh, who are given uh, some of the materials that have been sent from, uh, been written by Family Radio, and they won't even open the cover or even open the cover. Uh, and and why? Why? Because they are in denial. They don't want to know. And and uh, that is not the mark of a true believer. A true believer is 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 inquisitive. What what else does the Bible teach? Uh, I or is it possible that I have a doctrine that uh, is not as accurate as it should be? Well, I I'd like to be corrected. In fact, I'm one of my delights is being on this program where I can be corrected if I am I, I miss, if I'm going down a wrong path in some way because there's no value in just stubbornly holding a position because this is what we've always held. There's no value in that. The value is in seeking truth, seeking truth. And the only way you're going to find truth is in the Bible. Well, thank you for calling and expressing your feelings. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a desire to understand the Bible. And I would like to know if you can help me. I have several questions that lead to my understanding, so please let me ask all several of them once you give me the information, the truth. Okay, my question is, now, God made all things, so am I one of those things that God made? You are... Every human being was created by God. We we are very complex creatures, and God has very uh, has designed us and spoke and brought us into existence. Now, now, uh, thank God in all things. So that's what I thought. I thought I was made by God. Now, I I want to know something about the creation of how when. Um, Adam um, ha- started to make people with Eve. Eve was the mother of all living cre- of all living people. Is that how it was that um, well, well, there was Adam and there was Eve, and then there started to be people living on Earth? Exactly correct. You have that exactly accurate. Now, can you tell me who were the Nephilim in chapter Genesis? Genesis, Genesis chapter, chapter six. 6, number 4, and please don't hang up till I understand. Thank you, sir. Yeah, now the Nephilim, there is, 
uh, is a word that uh, is translated in our in some Bibles as giants. Uh, actually, that word Nephilim is only used in one other place. Uh, where it is speaking about a family of giants, they were called Nephilim, and that's why they use, that's the way they translate it that way in Genesis 6. Actually, from however the context of Genesis 6, it says they were men of renown, or men of the name, actually. And I think we can understand those, that to mean that they were those who were the, uh, the, uh, supposedly the most learned in the Word of God who uh, were the men of the name of God. That is, they uh, uh, were leaders of the people, uh, spiritual leaders of one kind or another. And yet uh, and yet, it was also a time of great wickedness that was going on so that God purposed to destroy the world of that day because of that wickedness. But the thank- Nephilim... Let's go ahead. Was Goliath one of the Nephilim, the giants? No, no. No, no so, that, there was another family of giants uh, completely apart from the uh, yeah, yeah, the, c- completely apart from the family of Goliath. Goliath came from a family of giants. It doesn't mean there was a whole race of people that were giants. So but, they were born from Adam and Eve. Oh, yes. The they, giants. They were all, they came from Adam and Eve. Oh, I see. Okay. I thank you so very much. Now, my last question is, when Jesus died on the cross and he gave up the ghost, was that something that was visually seen? Oh, uh, well, let's say it this way. First of all, Christ was very visible as he was nailed to the cross and as God was pouring out his wrath on him. And incidentally, when God poured out his wrath on him, that had nothing to do with the pain that Jesus experienced because of of uh, being crucified or because uh, uh, they had less, they had beaten him or whatever. It, it was a spiritual pain that had to be so great. It was equivalent to uh, those he came to save spending an eternity in hell. So it was something super awful. But then finally, while he, Christ was still very much alive, he was hanging on the cross, he said, It is finished. Now he was still... A, a, a very much alive. He uh, uh, physically, uh, uh, he was there, still able to speak. He was, he still had his blood and so on. And then he said, uh, uh, the last thing he said, Father, into Thy hands I commit my spirit, which is simply saying, now I am ready to physically die. And uh, so his the spirit left his body, just like when the thief next, the thieves next to him. They also died about the same time, and their spirits would have left their bodies. And and uh, that, of course, is not visibly seen. Nobody can see a spirit leave the body. If you've ever been at the bedside of someone who has died, uh, at one moment they are consci- they, they they may be in a coma, uh, but they're breathing and they're warm to some degree, and uh, and then the next moment. Their breathing stops, and uh, and uh, their body begins to grow cold, and it means that the soul has left the body, and nobody can witness the soul leaving the body. We can witness the person dying, but we cannot witness the soul leaving the body. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. I just want to take um, note to a scripture that's in the Bible. Um, First James, um, chapter one. First, First James, chapter one. First Thessalonians, chapter one. No, James. James. James, um, chapter one, verse one. James, chapter one, verse one. Uh huh. Okay, James, the servant of God and of the twelve, uh, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes that are scattered abroad. Greeting. Is that the verse? Yeah. Um. I just want to make a comment on that. He was talking about the twelve tribes, but he was talking to the churches. 
So yeah. when you take that back to um, Revelation, when they was talking about the twelve tribes that came out of um, that came out of um, the church age, about the one hundred and forty-four thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Is that verse linked to that? Yes, it, it, it's the same 12 tribes. In other words, it's talking, the book of James is, is written for all those who are, are interested in the Bible. And, and that would, uh, these, uh, we could paraphrase this, for example, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to all those who uh, are identified with the kingdom of God wherever you are in the world, which are scattered abroad, greeting my brethren, and so on. And gives and uh, it uh, the twelve tribes are more clearly defined in Revelation seven and in Revelation fourteen, uh, principally by the fact that uh, that there finally came a, a time when that that. Uh, uh, those particular prophecies were completed when, uh, when uh, because that had to happen before the Great Tribulation would begin. I understand that. Um, could we look at another scripture? Oh, I'm in Ezekiel. I think it's Ezekiel um, three when he was talking about um, Ezekiel supposed to take on um, one third of his hair. Yeah, Ezekiel chapter uh, uh, 5. Yeah, chapter 5, yeah. Yeah, take a barber's razor and cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thy beard. Then take the balances to weigh and divide the hair. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled. And thou shalt take a third part and smite about it with a knife. And a third part thou shalt scatter in the wind. And I will draw out a sword after them. Now you see. Can I ask a question? Um, yeah. That third part is also linked to Revelation. When he, um, the one third of the ship was destroyed, also oh, ended up staying into the church age. With um, it's, it's, one third of the ship was destroyed in Revelation. It's very, very definitely related to uh, these one thirds that you find that are destroyed in Revelation eight and Revelation nine. Uh, you see, hair in the Bible signifies. Uh, a covering, a covering, and and uh, uh, when God talks about hair, normally the covering is the blood of the Lord Jesus, or the fact that Christ has paid for your sins. That is, hair uh, has to do with those who identify with the kingdom of God, and normally uh, one third also would identify with those who are in, are in the kingdom of God, as we read. In uh, Zechariah 13, verse 9, but all those within the kingdom of God, externally, externally in the kingdom of God, that is, who are church members or who believe that they have become saved, are not necessarily saved. It parallels what we read in uh, in uh, Romans chapter 9. In in Romans chapter 9, we read there. Let me turn to that a moment, where uh, it says uh, that in uh, Romans 9, he says, uh, though in verse 27, though the number of the children of Israel, and we could paraphrase that, though there's a number uh, who are externally identified with the kingdom of God, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. So while it is true that the that the that the uh, number one third applies to all those who claim to be Christian, the fact is there's only a remnant of those who are actually saved. And so when God is destroying the one third of everything. Uh, the ships in the sea, uh, 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 a third of the sea became blood and so on in, uh, in Revelation 8. Or when he is talking in Ezekiel 5 about cut off your hair and, and, it, and a third is burned in the fire and a third is uh, uh, gone into the wind and so on. He is discussing those who 
externally were in the kingdom of God and never did become saved. They are not part of the remnant, indicating that God has this whole plan of bringing his judgment upon the, uh, the, uh, uh, the churches. Um, can I just ask one more question? In the book of Jude, they had um, a verse that said a certain man crept in. Who would that certain man would be? No, I'm sorry. What verse in Jude? Um, I'm not sure what quite verse. I'm going to take a look at it right now. It said a certain man crept in. Oh, oh, verse 4. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that's verse 4. That, you see, parallels what God taught in Matthew 13 when he talked about the terrors that an enemy has sown within the uh, congregations. They are those who have come in. They look like they are true believers. They uh, externally are are. They look to be like they are beautiful Christians. They're charming. They're intelligent. Uh, they claim that the Bible is a word of God and so on. And yet they have never, never become a child of God. And there they are, uh, really still as servants of Satan. They're still under the authority of Satan because uh, they are not saved. They have not, uh, uh, Christ is not their king. And they are the ones who uh, are doing enormous damage throughout the church age. It already began when you go back to Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. Already in the seven churches named there, uh, uh, there were, uh, Satan was ruling to some degree in some of the churches through this kind of a method. Certain men crept in unawares who were before of ordained of old to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God. Now they're denying the Lord God because eventually they are substituting their own understanding of the grace of God and of the salvation plan of God rather than carefully, carefully making sure they're following the biblical's understanding. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, how you doing, Mr. Canting? How's your day? Very well, thank you. I, was wa- I wanted to ask you a question. I was watching a program on TV on one of the learning channels and stuff. I know how the Bible was written because I heard you explain that before and stuff. And uh, they were saying about these books in the Bible that were put in and stuff like that. And like the stuff they were reading, though, from the, the books, that were, it doesn't seem like they, it doesn't seem like they, there was anything wrong with them and stuff. And then I want to ask you another quick question. Uh, now you hear a lot of this stuff about Mary Magdalene being uh, married to Jesus. I don't believe that at all. And then they're saying that uh, Mary Magdalene wasn't a prostitute. Is there any uh, scriptures in the Bible that says that if she was a prostitute or not, or what? Well, you, you know, there's all kinds of material that has been written by people about characters that are named in the Bible, like Mary Magdalene. Now, the Bible, uh, uh, like about Mary Magdalene, I don't know, I've never checked this out, but I think if we took every verse of the Bible that spoke about Mary Magdalene, we'd probably find about five verses, maybe. And uh, we know that uh, uh, she had... Uh, evil spirits at one time that were cast out. We know that she loved Jesus as all, all, like a lot of other people loved Jesus because he was her master. It was not a romantic love in any sense of the word. And that she was a picture of all of us. Before we're saved, we were under the, under the authority of Satan and Christ has opened our spiritual eyes and we become are those who have, who love the Lord Jesus with a passion. And so whatever we do, don't read those uh, statements that claim to have some uh, truth or some evidence of truth or whatever. Forget it. It's all out of the mind of man. The only true document 
that tells about the Bible characters is the Bible. And if it's not in the Bible, don't buy it. Okay, I'll take your advice. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Harold. How are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Okay, Harold, I understand from uh, your point of view and many others as I take this journey in the Christian walk that the church age is over. What I'm wondering is, is it a lot harder now for people to get saved that the church age is over? Well, you see, the whole question is, are we going to buy what the churches have taught us, namely, you need us to get you saved? That is a big, fat lie. We don't need anybody to save us except God. Now, it is true that the churches throughout the church age were given the, the, uh, uh, the task of, of uh, uh, sending out the gospel into the world to tell people what the gospel had to teach, and they were to invite people into their congregation when they did become saved. But I can tell you uh, for absolutely certain, there's not one church that got any individual saved. Only Christ can save someone. Now, the church would like to take the honor. They would like to have the credit. We got them saved, and they use that kind of language quite frequently. But it is not true. Uh, the work of salvation is 100% God's work. It has always been that way. Uh, and, and now that, and, and one of the big reasons that I truly believe that God is no longer using the churches is because they are an enormous roadblock, uh, stopping the, the possibility of people hearing the truth so through the word of God that they might become saved by God alone. They, they go into the church and they ask about a verse in the Bible and then immediately an explanation is given that the church holds and that explanation is not true to the Bible. So that person is directed into a salvation plan quite alien to that of the Bible. And that's why God today is saving outside of the churches where there will not be that confusion, where there will not be that that um, that situation going on. Hold on, I'll be right back with you right after this message. When the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, God is not saying faith cometh by hearing the church or hearing a pastor or hearing the teacher. Uh, the faith cometh by hearing the Word of God. Now, the only way we're going to listen to the Word of God is if we don't come to the Bible with any preconceived ideas. If we may have made up our mind on how the way God saves and so on, and, and now we're going to come to the Bible and hear what God has to say about that, and immediately we're going to change the meaning of what God has said. We are not listening to the Word of God, and that means we're not in the environment where God could save us, if, even if he planned to save us, he'd have to somehow uh, get us out of that environment. And, uh, and so it's very important that when we come to the Bible, we come without any preconceived ideas. Oh, Lord, you teach me. I want to hear what you have to say. And, and, and that's the only way. But thank yeah. you. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yes, so uh, I've got two questions. What's the meaning of dross? And um, uh, they said to remove the dross from the silver, and there will be a refiner for the furnace. Yeah, excuse me, would you turn your radio off, please? We're getting a little uh, feedback. Now, the meaning of the word, John, I'm sorry, I cannot help you with that. All right. The meaning of the word, dross. Uh, but now, insofar as the refining of silver, you know, when we go back to... Uh, 
uh, Zechariah, where God uses that kind of language. Or maybe, let me go to another passage uh, that, uh, that will help us. In Romans, no, in Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 17, I believe it is, let me turn to that. Proverbs 17, verse 3, we read, The refining pot is for silver, and the furnace for gold. But the Lord, Jehovah, trieth the hearts. Now, you see, the the furnace was used, as it is used in the Bible, as a picture of of, uh, uh, of experiencing hell for our sins, and Christ, uh, He is the one who who endured the furnace of God's wrath on behalf of those who become believers, and that's at least implied in Zechariah. Let me also turn to that a moment. In Zechariah chapter thirteen. Chapter 13, verse 9, he says, I will bring the third part through the fire. Now, when he says that, through the fire, there he is, uh, and, and will refine them as silver and refined, and will try them as gold, and they shall call on my name. At least there's an implication when he talks about through the fire, that he would endure the fires of hell on our behalf. But God also heavily uses that phrase, I will refine them as silver is refined, that is, as the dross is burnt off, uh, or, or or put them in the furnace as gold is 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 uh, uh, is uh, put in the gold to refine it. Uh, it's talking about the fact that when we think we are saved, God will put us through testing programs. You remember what we read in uh, in uh, Psalm 139, Psalm Psalm 100 and. 39, we read there, uh, uh, verse 4, or verse 1, O Lord, O Jehovah, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down city, and so on. The fact is that, and we read in verse 23, and this is the desire of the true believers. Uh, This is uh, Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, that is, test me, like silver is refined in the in the in uh, f- uh, the fir- fire and the uh, and gold is is refined in in the fire and know my thoughts because you see we uh, if we have become a true believer uh, God will test us so, uh, so that we can know uh, if we are if we go through the test uh, and still trusting in the Lord or whether we're going to fall apart just trusting in ourselves and uh, that's uh, that parallels what we read in Second uh, Corinthians chapter 13, where we read, "Examine me," uh, that, that we are to examine ourselves whether we're really in the faith. We want to be tested because, in this means, we can know, get further assurance that I'm really a child of God, or it may reveal I'm not a child of God, and I can still pray for God to God for mercy. I can come to God and plead with Him. Oh Lord, I thought I was saved, but my my, uh, I, I every time You test me, I fail the test, and oh Lord, have mercy. Maybe I too can become saved. One question. Do you think the Lord um, tests people who are closer to Him than people who are not closer to the Lord more frequently? I, I don't know. I don't know how he, how frequently He tests anybody. I don't know that. I know. Right. I know. Right. It, it's you know. It's very very. Uh, surprising to us, uh, like Abraham, who was, oh my, he was a child of God par excellence, and yes. yet we read about him in uh, in Genesis chapter and uh, chapter uh, verse chapter twenty two verse one, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. That word tempt is the word test or prove. 
uh, uh, God did test Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and sacrifice him. Talk about a test. And what did Abraham do? He immediately obeyed. But earlier on, you know, God tested Abraham. Remember that when he was with the... Uh, uh, he had come into the land. The God promised that his progeny would uh, inherit the world. World, he would be the father of a multitude of believers. And yet, Sarah, his wife, uh, got older and older and older, and finally was way beyond the age of childbearing. And then Abraham failed the test. He decided, well, maybe uh, God can c- accomplish this through. Uh, uh, through Hagar, a, a servant of Sarah, and so Ishmael was born. He had failed the test. But now, uh, some 14 years have passed by, uh, or no, maybe 20 years, or maybe a little more than that have passed by, and now Abraham is tested, and we read in after God came to him with this enormous, enormous, Really terrible command to sacrifice his son Isaac. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. He was not failing the test this time at all. But that's the way God deals with us as believers and it's a real, a real important fact in our life that when he does, it doesn't mean that we're ready to say, Oh, Lord, I can't do it. I have no strength in myself. I don't know anything. I don't know what to do. But, Oh, Lord, I can, I, I have to wait upon thee. And you're in charge. And I, and somehow, whatever happens, I know that it's all going to be all right. And that, and when we can come to that point in our life, then we begin to get some increasing evidence that really my trust is in the Lord. After all, I am a child of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? 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 Yes. Hi, how you doing? Very well, thank you. Hey, I was wondering, um, what is that about the, uh, thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not murder? Well, you see, there again, uh, that command is found in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5. Uh, and when we uh, look at that, we have to uh, look at it in the light of everything the Bible teaches. Now, for example, uh, we can kill animals, certainly, and, uh, and soldiers uh, can, defending their country, they can They will have to kill. Uh, uh, We find, for example, that Samuel killed and Abraham killed and David killed and so on. They were not murderers, but they were they were doing the work that uh, that God would expect of of someone who is a believer and who is is uh, following God's commands and because there was nothing sinful about what they were doing when they killed. And so we, we have to, and on the other hand, for example, we read in Genesis 9, that whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Well, now the man who has to uh, execute or first find the person guilty and pass sentence on him, the judge, as well as the executioner, are killing that man if he has murdered someone. And that, again, is part of God's law, and that is that is permitted. What if, what if, I'm saying, I'm sorry for butting in, but I'm saying, what if, what if you were hunted? Like, what if someone was hunting you, and they've killed and killed on and so forth? Like, what if you were the hunted? What if you were hunting? No, hunted. Like, someone was after you to kill you. Would it, would it be a sin for you to harm them for, hunt, for trying to harm you and your family? Uh, uh, we uh, oh, oh, someone is trying. In other words, to protect your family, yeah, like you might have to tr- kill. Broke into your yeah, house, well, we can house. ask a lot of hypothetical questions, but I can tell you this: we do know that God has established authority, 
and he has given us uh, the, the policemen and the soldiers and, and the lawmakers and so on to protect the citizenry. And so that's the first place we are to look. For, secondly, uh, we have to remember that, uh, that uh, uh, for, for the true believer, death is not a, a, a terrible thing. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. And that's far more glorious than even being in the body. And so uh, you can set up these uh, these hypothetical questions, which at times become real questions, of course. But uh, uh, I think each situation has to be looked at itself. On the other hand, we find that the Apostle Paul, for example, when he was threatened, he would flee the city. But at another time, he, he was stoned and left for dead. And so you have both possibilities. And... And I think it's going to depend on each situation as it comes along. But I know this, that the Bible does say, Don't fear those who can destroy the body. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And that's, that's, that's the real truth that we want to really absorb in our life. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Harold. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Uh, three quick questions. One is, my friend asked me, uh, am I saved? Who am I, to, who am I to say, yes, I'm saved? You know, when there's no one, I mean, God didn't come down and tell me I was saved or and see a vision or anything else like that, but what do I tell him? Well, the the uh, this question is asked all the time by people who are who are convinced that if you're really saved, you can really know when you became saved. It was the time when you accepted Christ. And, right. and, and uh, you knew at that time, you were believed at that time, you had to become saved. And that's really the answer that they're looking for. Now, the fact is that, uh, that the evidence of salvation is that we have come to the point where we have a delight, a continuing delight in the Word of God. We want to constantly uh, check out what we uh, understand about the Bible to make sure we're as accurate as possible. We're ready to make correction, and and we walk very humbly. And, and such a person might say, well, from everything I know about my life, I think I probably am, but I have to leave that all together with the Lord. Okay, now, Harold, when God talks about his elect, I was assuming that he actually uh, singled out certain individuals. Is that true, or is, is it a few individuals that are singled out of that are the elect, I guess, special when, or whatever? Well, let me read what the Bible says. Just, just Here's what God says in Ephesians chapter 1. In a, there, uh, which which speaks about those who have become saved. Uh, there, okay. he, there he says, uh, "Blessed verse three, blessed be God and uh, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ." He's talking about true believers. According as he, that is God the Father, hath chosen us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. In other words, God is saying, that I have chosen already before I ever created the world all those that I plan to save, even okay. though they don't deserve it at all. Okay, now, Harry, my last question is, um, you know, I know the world will come to an end, and those who are saved will meet Christ, and those who are not will, you know, go to hell. But what I'm, what I'm wondering is, is people pick these dates and everything else, and what happens? What are we supposed to do when these dates come and, and nothing happens? What do you mean nothing's happened? Well, like for instance, you know, I I'm assuming I, I've heard over the air that you've actually picked the date where Christ will come. Is that true? Well, let me. You know, people ask that question, and uh, 
uh, almost in an intimidating way. How dare you? How dare you? Now, the role of a teacher, of a Bible teacher, is to faithfully declare what the Bible has said to the very best of his ability. And it means that he's, there's two things that are happening in his life if he's, a, if he's a qualified teacher of the Bible. First of all, he is constantly checking out in the Bible and cross-checking to make sure what he does teach is f- faithful to the Word of God. Secondly, he is ready to make correction at any time if he finds that he has taught something that is not as faithful as it should be. Now, from uh, we know from the Bible that God has given us an enormous amount of time information. God says that to every purpose there is time and judgment or time and the law. And so that and and we have as we search the Bible very carefully, we find all kinds of time references. We know for certain there will be a judgment day. We know there is a time that God has named for that. And we find lots of time information that focus on a particular date. All right now that date happens to be almost five years away from here, from us right now. That means over the next five years, uh, those of us who have searched this out and who have, who are, ch- are checking this and double checking will continue to do that. And a year from now or two years from now, if we find something we have missed so that that is no longer uh, that, that maybe there is a uh, uh, it has not been truly stated then a correction will be made on the other hand what I'm finding however is that that the more I study the Bible and check and cross check and so on the dates that we're talking about come out come to be more and more defined they appear to be more and more solidly there so I can't worry about what if I'm wrong or not. That's my, that's, uh, all I know is I got it from the Bible. Everything has to come from the Bible. And I can't second guess God and say, well, I don't know if this, I, I don't dare say this is not true. I, I, the only thing that could be that maybe I misunderstood something, but what the Bible says, that is true. And so, uh, I, I don't worry for a moment what will happen if we go past that date. That doesn't trouble me at all. That's uh, all, I, all I pray every day is, Oh, Lord, keep me faithful to the Word of God. Can you, is there anybody as far as, I mean, that is, uh, you know, it talks about in the Bible these things are to come, but whatever they might be, uh, you know, as far as, like the Prince of Persia, who is that a person that is to come in this world? Well, you you see, the problem is that people don't understand that the Bible teaches Christ spoke in parables. They spoke in parables. Now, the Prince of Persia that you're talking about, or you talk, read about him in Daniel chapter 10, that actually is Satan. He, uh, Persia is a picture there of the whole world. Uh, and and uh, so on, and you have to find, and you and you can only find this from the Bible. You can't get the, get uh, definitions out of the air someplace or from your own mind. It has to be found in the Bible, and and then then uh, we can uh, begin to get some understanding of these passages. Now, some understand some passages are very difficult to understand, exceedingly difficult. And on the other hand, other passages are much easier. And then, every now and then, a very difficult passage, uh, you finally are able to understand what God is saying, and you'll know you have truth when you find harmony, and all everything in the Bible has to harmonize. It has to harmonize. It has, it has to fit together. And when you, if you discover a piece of information or think you found something that's quite alien to everything else you've found 
Well, then you begin to ask, but well, now wait a minute, maybe, how, how did I get that? I better do some more checking. But when you finally, uh, uh, as you are checking out a passage and you finally find it, get it to an understanding, carefully working with that passage, using only the Bible data, and you find that your conclusion is in harmony with, with everything else you've been learning from the Bible, then you can be fairly certain that you have correctly understood that passage. Uh, in other words, the whole thing gets, gets more and more locked in together, and you become more and more certain that we're on the path to truth. And that's, that's, uh, that's exactly what's happening on this whole business of the timeline of history also. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Um, could you explain Isaiah 66, verses 22 to 23, the last chapter for me, please? Yeah, uh, turn your radio off, please. You, uh, Isaiah 66, yeah, verse the last 22, chapter, 22 and 23. For one full moon to one seven. What does that mean? Yeah, there we read. Uh, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me. Now, the new heavens and the new earth, they are going to be created immediately after God is finished with this universe. He has caught up all the true believers to be with him. All the unsaved have been judged and cast into a place called hell or the lake of fire. And then he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And, and, and saith the Lord, saith Jehovah, so shall your seed and your name remain. Now, in the next verse, God uses the language, excuse me, God uses the language of the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament because they were pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. And so it says, as So it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of... Uh, of the men that have transgressed men me against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be of their pouring unto all flesh. Now, from one Sabbath to another, is focusing on the fact that these are people who have trusted all together in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they have trusted in the Bible in all that it has to teach uh, concerning the. Uh, concerning God's Word. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening. Thanks for taking my call. Um, are you familiar with the Mayan calendar? Uh, go ahead with your call. What, what, pardon? Are you familiar with the Mayan calendar? Uh, well, I do know this much about it. Uh, the Mayans were very skilled uh, in their day. Uh, they existed around 800 A.D., and they have a foundation date on their calendar that uh, links up to something that is in the Bible because their foundation date, when we, when we compare it with the, uh, the calendar of the Bible, we find it was... Uh, they, at a time when Peleg, uh, who, uh, whose name is was called Peleg, uh, we read about him in Genesis chapter 10, I believe, that in his days the earth was divided. And he was 39 years old in that particular year that identifies with that foundation date. And it could be very well possible that uh, that the Mayans look upon that time when God divided one huge continent into the several continents that we now have, that that was the year that that happened. Uh, they also have another date, 2012, which I thought was ironic because... Well, I've heard about that, but I wouldn't, I, I don't, I wouldn't pay any attention to that because uh, no date anywhere, that could be uh, just coincidental that it's, it's, that it's close to 
Uh, what the Bible is teaching is the likelihood is 2011, but I certainly would put not one ounce of trust in that kind of uh, a prophecy by a pagan nation. One last question. Um, what is the difference between a fellowship and a church? And Well, you know... What, I, uh, one, excuse me, I'm sorry. And... Um, what if you're like have a church and you have to pay the bank uh, money because you bought the church? I mean, how how do they stop becoming a church to well, the Bible? You, you see, the this business of fellowships is a problem because particularly today, a great many churches now are calling themselves fellowships because they have somehow learned that. The word church is not very much acceptable anymore, but the, but the idea of fellowship might be acceptable. But the definition is not the name. Uh, the, the, the definition is what, how is that organized? The church, if it's a proper church, and the church age has gone on for 1955 years, and God gave very strict rules for it, it does have a membership. Uh, it does have uh, elders and deacons or a pas- and a pastor who have spiritual oversight. There are certain ceremonial laws of water baptism and the Lord's table that have to be carried out there. Hold on, right on. I'll finish this right after this message. The Bible teaches very clearly that we're not to be under the authority of a church that is uh, b- based on the rules of the Bible that where uh, you are a member there, where you are uh, have elders and deacons and a pastor who have spiritual authority over the members, and so on. Uh, that we are not to have any part of. Now, here is a little group of believers or people who are interested in the Bible. They want to come together to... Uh, to uh, to, uh, study the Bible together and have some fellowship together, what are they going to call themselves? They they want to have some kind of a name. They can call themselves a fellowship. They can call themselves a meeting of those who are interested in the Bible. They can call themselves just a meeting. They can call it anything they want. But the important thing is that they do not take on the trappings of a local congregation. There should be no spiritual authority there that uh, that has the oversight over the lives of others. That that there are is to be no membership. Uh, In other words, if uh, it should be a situation where people can come and go, and there are some great risks with this, because here comes an individual who believes he's a Bible teacher. He really wants to teach. He knows he can't be a preacher. But but he comes into a group of believers like this, uh, of interested people, and he begins to assume an authoritative position. I know the truth. You have to follow me. And he can lead those people astray just as much as any pastor can lead people astray. So uh, the Bible actually gives no... No mandate, no encouragement for this at all. When it says in uh, in, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not neglecting the assembling of ourselves, as the manner of some is, uh, but exhorting, and it would have to be exhorting ourselves as the day approaches, there we there we uh, there's no encouragement there for a group of people to come together it is simply that we're to uh, to uh, uh, we are to assemble with the god himself it is a mat we're living in a time where it is me and god you and god and uh, and uh, th- that is the way we are to begin to really focus then we're on very safe ground because then we know that the Bible is our only authority. Now, there can be teachers like you hear on family radio, but don't trust them. Check them out. Check out. And, you know, uh, one thing we're doing today that has not been done in the churches, we're, uh, we're trying to show exactly how we are to understand the Bible. We talk about the fact that Christ spoke in parables. We talk about 
the fact that we are to comparely, carefully compare Scripture with Scripture. We talk about the fact that God will test those who are true believers and so on. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Harold. How are you? I'm yeah. calling. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, I have uh, a curiosity on your opinion on what appears to be two different spirits talking. Uh, one spirit is in Deuteronomy uh, 12, 14. Right. The spirit appears to be very strict and godlike, and then right after it, Deuteronomy 12:15 it says notwithstanding you may do whatever you like. Now, how can this be? It's almost like two spirits talking there to to Moses I presume and I and I think it's God speaking in the first one 12:14 and then it almost seems like Satan coming in on 12:15 and saying Moses you don't have to do what he says in 12:14, you can do whatever you want, whatever your soul lusts after. I wonder if you could comment on that, the possibility of Satan trying to sneak in on 12:15. Well, no, Satan does not sneak in anywhere in the Bible. The whole Bible is the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Could you read those two in well, a row, 12.14 yes, yes. and 12.15, and see but, the dichotomy in that? Well, I, I, I read that, and it, it is true. These are very difficult verses, and it's not untypical in the Bible that we will find verses that seem very contradictory to, to each other, even, they're, yeah, even though they're right close by each other. But in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. Notwithstanding, thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. Now, actually, it really means just that desires after. According to the blessing of Jehovah thy God, which he hath given thee, the unclean and the clean may eat thereof as of the roebuck and as of the heart. Only ye shall not eat the blood, ye shall pour it upon the earth as water. Now, that word lust, why is that used from God? Why would he say you can have whatever your soul lusts at? Because that is a word put there by the translator. If you look up this word in the Hebrew, you'll find that it is, and I haven't looked, up at, looked at it recently, but you'll probably find that it is translated probably in three or four different ways. And in this particular context, the translators had to make a decision. They decided to put the word lust, and, and that may have been a very poor translation. Absolutely. Uh, well, but it, 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 as soon as you discuss, this substitute the word desire, because that's what lust really is, uh, we, we have a connotation or a, an understanding of the word lust as something that is very sinful. Although, again, the, the context has to be looked at. We can lust after God. We can lust that we want to be more and more faithful to Him. It really signifies desire. And once we uh, see that meaning, then this verse uh, doesn't look like it's a contrary verse anymore. And one other thing. When Moses went and received the commandments, and thou shalt not kill is so specific, and, and God would have used the word thou shalt not murder if he wanted to use the word murder, but he said not kill, and then how can the spirit turn around months or years later and say, now kill these people for sinning? I don't understand that. Because God wrote the Bible, so we're forced to compare Scripture with Scripture. As soon as we read the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not kill, immediately we have to say, What do you mean, Lord, Thou shalt not kill? How can I understand that? So, I begin to search the Bible, every place where God uses that word, kill, and see how God 
uses that word in practice. And from that, we begin to get definition. But you cannot get definition just from a single use of the word. It's the same as the word lust here. You have to see how that word is used throughout the Bible in order to really uh, make sure that you're not getting the wrong conclusion. All right, I thank you. But one last question. If you were Moses, if Harold Camping was Moses, and you received that thou shalt not kill, and then a year later the uh, another spirit perhaps said, now, Harold, Moses, I want you to kill this particular sinner. Now, would Harold Camping trust that and go and kill that particular sinner? Well, let's put it the other way. I, we don't have to. We don't have to say another spirit. We, we have the Bible. And the Bible tells us, that, and the whole, the whole Bible is God's Word, but we have to read it very carefully. And Moses also, as, uh, as God spoke to him, he, he, uh, he could tell whether it was God speaking to him. After all, I, 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 uh, Moses was a child of God. Satan did not have control of his life in any way. And, and you, please, we should not have a notion, any kind of a notion, that Satan was allowed to, to, uh, to uh, affect what is written in the Bible. This makes the Bible absolutely... Uh, uh, trustworthy and dependable. If it, if we could prove from the Bible that somehow there were passages that Satan uh, uh, was able to penetrate and cause this or that to be written, that would immediately destroy the authority of the whole Bible. But the Bible itself tells us, and we better listen to what God says. Holy men of God spoke as God, the Holy Spirit move them it's uh, and, and all scripture is uh, or all scripture is given by inspiration of god and once we keep those principles in mind we're not going to even think about this idea well could it possibly be that satan got into this word here in some way but thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Can you tell me, what is atheist? I'm sorry, repeat it? Atheist? An atheist? Yeah. Is that An atheist is someone who is denying there is a God. Uh, he, you know, every human being knows there is a God because we were created in the image of God and God's law is on the hearts of every human being. There's not one human being that doesn't know deep in his heart that there is a God. And many of the atheists are, are some of our most intelligent, brainy people. And, and, uh, they, deep in their heart, they know there is a God. But they also know, and this is also deep in the heart of every human being, that that we have to answer to God. And if we have broken the law of God, which is called sin, uh, we're in trouble with God. And that's a totally unacceptable thing to think about. Therefore, in their consternation and in their... Uh, 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 in the problem that this creates, they have come up what they think is a, a, a satisfactory solution. We'll just believe there is no God. And so they work overtime trying to prove there is no God. But they are simply uh, uh, whistling in the dark. They are simply... Uh, 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 sticking their head in the sand, hoping it would go away, because there is God. God, someone had to create this world, as beautiful and and complex as it is. Uh, there had to be a Creator God and who sustains it, and and that is the God that every human being has to answer to. No, sir. I'm sorry. Can an atheist be forgiven? Say if, like, uh, a family relative is an atheist and tells tells his other family relative that he doesn't believe in the Lord's and because um, my brother, uh, so forth, or my brother got shot in the head and I prayed and prayed for him and he came out of his his coma, his coma 
And I told him, this is all the Lord's doing, and this is all because of the Lord. And I prayed and prayed for you. That's the reason why you came out of your coma. And my brother told me, he's an atheist. He doesn't believe in the Lord. Is there any way I could pray for him and have the gates open for him, or is he a complete sinner, and is he going to go to hell? Well, you know, you and I can't get anybody saved. We have a great desire for our loved ones that they might become saved, but God has to save them. And so, and just because you prayed for a, your brother and he became uh, out of his coma, that isn't necessary. What if he had died? Would God still be hearing you if you're a child of God? Of course he would. But then you would have known, well, that was God's will. That, uh, because, and God has a perfect will. We, we, we leave those matters up to God. Now, insofar as convincing somebody that they should start reading the Bible or that they should uh, see the fact that they're in deep trouble with God. We can't cause them to do that if they're in denial. God has to open their hearts. And so all we can do is beg God, and God wants us to do that. We can pray God. We can beseech God. We can implore God. Oh, God, uh, I'm so troubled. I'm so worried about this loved one or that loved one. Could it be that thou will have mercy on him? But I know I have to leave it all the way up to you. Because God is the only one that can open anybody's heart. He, he was the only one who could open my heart to the truth, or anybody to the truth. None of us are able to do it of ourselves, or because of the convincing arguments of our fellow man. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yeah. I have a couple questions I've been reading in Exodus, and I'm, I'm curious as to why God gave Moses the two tablets of stone the first time Moses went to, up the mount, and the second time Moses took two tablets up to the mount with him. Well, I don't know. Uh, that's the way God had ordained it. First of all, the two tablets of stone uh, uh, is, is already pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the foundation upon which uh, all gospel is built. And God is the total author of that. And, and then remember when Moses came down with the two tablets that God had wrote on with his own finger, that, uh, and he found Israel in deep sin, he smashed the stones, uh, because uh, it was an outward sign that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that Israel had severely broken the law of God, just as he broke the two tablets of stone. And so now he goes back up on the mountain uh, with new uh, pair of new stones that he himself cut out. So, uh, but uh, uh, so God could write upon it again. Now, why? Why uh, he could not go up in the mountain and God give him the law once more? Maybe that's the the situation. Christ only uh, is the stone of stumbling. He is the foundation stone only once. He's not twice. He's only think, once. Maybe that's now there's the reason. Another question, please. Uh, Exodus thirty six five through seven, particularly num verse number seven, please. Yeah. Uh, 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 Exodus chapter 36, verse 7. Let's look Five at that. 5 through 7. Yeah, let's look at that. Exodus 36. There we read, And they spake unto Moses, uh, 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 It's talking there about the building of the tabernacle. And they spake unto Moses, saying, These are the wise men and the people who were employed to do all the, the craftsmanship that it was required. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it and too much. Now, I have never worked on these verses, and of course, they're in the Bible for spiritual purpose. And, and But I would be, uh, I'm afraid I would be... Uh, uh, 
uh, guessing if I tried to quickly tell you what these ver- word, uh, verses mean spiritually, and I would rather not speculate. Good enough, then, Mr. Cameron. Thank you Thank for you. calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, brother. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, brother Camping, in John 3.16, we find uh, that word, so, for God so loved the world. Uh, then, then I find it again in Romans 11.26, that same word. Could you speak to that a little bit and, and just explain a little better how we know that that word which, means which word? in this way? Uh, which word are you talking about? The word so, like uh, for God, God so, so loved the world. Well, yeah. You see, uh, I've read commentaries by people who basically seem to know a whole lot about the Bible, that is, uh, for their day, uh, and, and they've looked at this and they say, For God so loved the world. That is, in this wonderful fashion, He loved the world. Now, what they have done is they have taken that word and put what seemed to be the meaning in this verse. But when we look up this verse in the Bible, we find that ordinarily it means that in this manner, or thus, God loved the world. For God in this manner loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. God is describing why God's love has come upon the world, and that is that Christ that God gave the Lord Jesus Christ as our sin bearer for all those that he had come to save. And, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, we have to start with that in order to begin to get any under, real understanding of what this verse is teaching. How, how about when it's used in Romans 11.26? Now let's look at there, Romans 11.26. Romans 11:26, uh, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. And there again, and in this manner shall all Israel be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away in godliness from Jacob. Now, what is the manner that all uh, uh, that all Israel shall be saved? He has just explained earlier on in Romans chapter 11, that as the gospel went to Israel, we, we read in Romans chapter 11, verse, verse uh, 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 5, Even so, then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Our verse 8, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should see, or, no, let me see. Verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So when we tie these verses together, we see, and these, this is not contradicted by anything else in the Bible, that in Israel, using that as a figure of all those who uh, w- would identify later on with the kingdom of God throughout the church age, where there were those who were blinded, and there were those who were elected to salvation. And it is in this manner that all Israel, uh, going now to uh, in uh, to verse 26, in this manner, all Israel that is to be saved, shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer. And that's talking about the fact that Christ has come to save those whom he planned to save. Thank you, brother. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our last question? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Hello, Mr. Camping. Uh, The Bible clearly teaches that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So therefore, we can pray, Lord Jesus, please save me. Lord Jesus, please save me. And if we're willing to seek him with all of our hearts, then he will be faithful to save us because he will never turn anyone away. Well, now you see what you have done with this verse is what the evangelical community does constantly. You've taken this verse and you've put a meaning to it that will not allow 
be allowed if you compared everything in the scripture. In other words, you have you have uh, you have misdirected the person reading that verse. You have given them the idea, if I can just call fervently enough upon the Lord, God will save me. And the Bible does not teach that. That would be mean that it's some work that I am do, doing to become saved. So what you really do, you've uh, done, you've set a trap. You've really set a terrible trap for these dear people. They, they listen to you and they say, oh, well, that's all what I'll do. I'll call fervently on the name of the Lord. And, and I, and then the next thing they're told they are saved and they get baptized and so on in water. That's also a, a part of the, that's misunderstood altogether. And so now they, they blissfully go on for the rest of their life thinking all is well when they have never, never uh, become saved because they are they are being they are listening they're not listening to the bible they're listening to the theologian or the bible teacher if we listen to the bible then we have to say oh yes it does say we have to call upon the name of the lord but it also says that if we call upon him or seek him with all our heart and soul and then we read a little further and we find that God has to give us, God has to give us a new heart and a new soul. Uh, and so there's a whole lot more that has to go along with this in order to make sure that we are faithful to what the Bible is teaching. It is a terrible, terrible thing that is going on that people are, they read a verse like this and then they're immediately uh, that uh, verse is emptied of its true meaning uh, by those who claim that they're really Bible students. They believe the Bible is the Word of God. They uh, they they get the person to believe that they really know the Word of God, and yet they are never, never checking it all out throughout the Bible. And what a terrible, terrible thing to do to people. They, they but, would say... But don't you think it's a little bit odd that you would say what a terrible thing it is to teach people to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus? Do you really think that's a terrible thing to do? No, no, no. I didn't say that at all. It's not a, it, the problem is not calling upon the name of the Lord. Of course, that's a command. Call upon the name of the Lord. But the moment that you added to that, if you call upon the name of the Lord, God will save you. That verse doesn't say that. Yes, it does. Well, uh, yeah, but you, you are saying that God will save you, but you are saying it without paying attention to everything else the Bible says. The verse when, says, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. That's right. And God's, and God, but God gives a lot more explanation of what it means to call upon the name of the Lord that you also have to offer. You have to call upon Him with all your heart and soul. And you can't call upon Him with all your heart and soul unless you, God has given you a new heart and soul. So what you have to say is, you know, those who, uh, who have been given a new heart and soul, uh, as they will be calling upon the name of the Lord and will, because they've already become saved. But in the meanwhile, you don't know whether God has, uh, is going to save you, but you can call upon Him. That is the command God gives to call upon Him and to repent of your sins and to seek Him with all your heart. That is a command. But please, don't believe that that's going to get you saved. But this puts you listening to the Word of God. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If As, as we seek out the, the meaning of these phrases, we are listening to the Word of God. And, it's, and faith cometh by hearing, and we can only hear if we listen to the Word of God, and not to explanations that don't take into account the whole Word of God. But thank you for calling. We've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum. May the Lord richly bless you.